You know, there's this guy I read about, this is, this is amazing, and I don't remember his name, but he, he found out about this worm that was called the guinea worm. And guinea worm is a really horrible thing, and you can look it up if you want, but I'll tell you a little bit about it, even though it's very distasteful. So a guinea worm is a parasite that lives in Africa, and it burrows under your skin, and it's quite long. It's about that long, and it's, you know, about that wide. And so it'll burrow underneath your leg, and then it's in there, you know, and maybe it pokes its little head out a hole, which is one of its delightful tendencies. And then if you want to pull it out, it breaks, right? Because, obviously, because otherwise you'd just pull it out, and it would be dead, and so it doesn't like that, so it just breaks off. And many, many people had this horrible disease, you know, and it, it, it well, you, could, you can't imagine what that would be like because you're part of the 1%, and you live in North America, and thank God for that, but... You know, just a little imagine, you don't even want to think about it, let alone have it. And he went to Africa and wiped the damn thing out. It's like, well, great, you know, it seems to me the planet's a lot better off without any guinea worms on it. Even though that's like guinea worm genocide talk, I'm still, <laughs> you know, pretty happy about it. And so that was, that was one guy who thought, well, we don't need these things. And yeah, well, fair enough, you know, and... and <laughs> Yeah, well, so good for him, like, you know, I mean, he can die thinking that the world's a better place than it was when he first popped out, and so, so good for that. that and that's a, I think that's a good, that's a good aim, you know, I, I think, is to, to think that when you're on your deathbed, and you can look back and think, well, there's a little less suffering in the world from here on out than there would be if I had never existed, and that's a lot better than the opposite, because it's certainly possible, say, if you're Stalin, to ensure that there's a hell of a lot more suffering in the world than there would have been if you hadn't lived. And we perfectly well know that people can manage that. And that many, many people try to do nothing but, ima but manage precisely that. So, and it's hard for me not to think about that as some sort of metaphysical evil. And, and I think it's the right way to look at it. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. So yeah, you have the sun here and then the moon here, as far as I can tell. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think this is the moon over here, but, yeah, but, so, yeah, and that's part of the Sistine Chapel, which is, you know, an absolutely remarkable, and, and, you know, part of the reason, too, and the part of the reason I'm teaching about these biblical stories is because, you know, I'm thinking, because the humanities have been decimated so badly, and, and, and again, I think that has mostly to do with resentment and hatred more than anything else, but I don't really think that you can get a grip on the humanities and, and what they have to offer without knowing the biblical stories, because they're the, they're the dream out of which the humanities emerge, and so unless you have that background knowledge, that dream, then there's all sorts of things that are utterly profound that, that don't open themselves up to you, and Dante's Inferno would be one of those, and Milton's Paradise Lost, which is an absolutely amazing piece of work. I mean, Milton wrote it because he wanted to justify the ways of God to man. You know, what an ambition that is. And I mean, he was serious about that. He took the problem seriously. It's like, it's the Mephistophelian problem is that, well, this is a rough business that we're involved in. And, you know, maybe, maybe we should just give it up. And I think the world, the whole world, I think, was deciding that in the 1980s when we were deciding whether we were going to engage in the ultimate nuclear catastrophe, you know. And we were very, very close to that a number of times. And I think it was a collective decision in some sense on the part of humanity that we might as well keep the whole awful game going rather than just demolish it. But, um, but you know, Milton, he wrote Paradise Lost to... It's a dream, again, it's a dream, and trying to explain the nature of being and the nature of evil. And you can't crack the damn thing without knowing the underlying stories. And, and that's really too bad because it's utterly profound. And, the reason you need profound things, as far as I can tell, you need profound knowledge is because life is actually a profound problem for everyone. I mean, you can shelter back and live a very conservative existence and look, like more power to you, I understand why you would do that, but it doesn't stop you from having to face the ultimate questions of life, right? They're right there in everyone's face, and at least at some point in your life. And it would be better if you could, I think, if you could confront them full on. And, and to deal with them properly and to be a beacon of strength as a consequence of that. It's, and, it's, and I think that wisdom, that's what the humanities are supposed to teach, is wisdom. And wisdom is what enables you to deal honorably with the tragedy of life. And I think you, I can't see how you could think that that was a bad idea because there are going to be times when you're in an emergency room and, you know, prone to panic and to, and to cry and to break down and to, and to collapse and to be of no use to anyone around you. And that's not the right way to be. 
it's the right way to be in a situation like that is to be strong and reliable and I don't think you can do that without being wise and you can't be wise without putting yourself together and without knowing something about where you came from and what you're like and that, that's history and the humanities and so this isn't optional it's, it's, it's more necessary, the man does not live by bread alone and that's exactly the issue here and so you see these magnificent works, you know, I mean there's a there's, it's not like Michelangelo thought of this literally, you know, he was a genius for God's sake and he's trying to get at something and, and he's trying to get at the profundity of human culture, I suppose that's why you have this patriarchal figure here and, and the, the cosmic role that consciousness and tradition plays in, in being itself and, and it's ennobling and you know, you think people, religious or not, people hundreds of millions of people come from all over the world to Rome and go through this little tiny chapel to look at this there's something in it that everyone needs to see you know, it's not just beauty, it's more than beauty it's, it's that which feeds the soul and, and everyone feels that, even if they can't explain it